So in this video, we're going to start talking about the process of cellular metabolism. And the question that we're going to try to answer is how do we convert sugar into usable forms of energy? And so as my representation of sugar, I've chosen my favorite ice cream, Ben and Jerry's American Dream. And what, I'm, what I want to introduce you to is how do we get from, from what we eat uh, to what we do. And you can pick your favorite activity if it's surfing or solving a puzzle or taking a dog for a walk, right? So how, how, do, we, how do we get from point A to point B? So what cellular metabolism is, is a set of metabolic reactions that convert biochemical energy from the food we eat into ATP. Remember, ATP is our cell's energy currency. So I'll, I want to begin by introducing you to some common themes and some key terms that we use when we're talking about metabolic pathways. And so the first theme that I'll introduce you to is that the pathways that break down molecules are connected to the pathways that build larger molecules. And so we have two terms to describe these different pathways. We call pathways that break down molecules, we call these catabolic pathways. And I've always remembered this by thinking about a cat that's breaking apart a ball of yarn and has the zoomies, right? So the second pathway is anabolic pathways. And these are the ones that synthesize those larger molecules. And, and these are connected. The other theme is that enzymes that catalyze these chemical reactions, either for catabolic pathways or anabolic pathways, work together in a manner that resembles an assembly line in a factory. So in this example here, if we wanna go from, from product A to product B, that reaction is catalyzed by enzyme one. B then becomes a reactant even though it was a substrate before, it becomes a reactant for the second reaction that's catalyzed by enzyme two. And at the end of that reaction, we end up with product C and so on. So this is the assembly line that I'm talking about. And these reactions, yes, they do go both ways, but we're mostly going to be talking about them going in one direction um, during cellular metabolism. The other thing I wanna point out is that enzymes are regulated. And this is for a variety of reasons, but one reason is that these catabolic and anabolic pathways should be in a constant balance. So we should be breaking down things and we should be making things, and this results in homeostasis or a tendency towards equilibrium. And so I want to begin by just talking about some different kinds of enzyme regulation, and these will come up repeatedly during the process of cellular respiration. And there's two types of en enzyme regulation. There's non-covalent regulation. So this is when we're not forming covalent bonds. And then there's covalent regulation when we're, when we're making or breaking covalent bonds. So let's talk about those non-covalent modifications that regulate enzymes, okay? And so here I wanted to introduce you to these regulatory molecules. These can be proteins or other molecules that um, bind to an enzyme and regulate its function. And the first one I'll introduce is, is a regulatory molecule that acts as a competitive inhibitor. Okay, so here in green, we have our enzyme and we have the active site here with these little divots where our substrates bind. And then the enzyme is gonna facilitate the transition state between these, these substrates to make a product. And so this, was, this is what would happen if the enzyme was working in the absence of regulation. But another regulatory molecule can come along. And if the regulatory molecule can fit in the active site, then it can block the ability of the, of the reactants to bind. And so the product can't form. And so this is, again, when a regulatory molecule binds to the enzyme's active site, it is a competitive inhibitor. Another type of inhibition is called allosteric inhibition. And in this example, right, we have our reactants that bind to the active site, but a regulatory molecule can come along and it can bind to the enzyme at a site that's different than the active site. 
And what this does is it changes the shape of that enzyme. And we often refer to this as a conformational change. And due to this shape change, the active site is no longer accessible to the reactants. And so this turns off the enzyme. So these are two types of inhibition, one in which the regulatory molecule binds to the active site, and the other one where it binds to a site other than the active site. This allosteric interaction can also activate an enzyme, and that's shown here. So here we have this enzyme, but the substrates can't bind to the active site yet due to the shape of this enzyme. But when the regulatory molecule binds at a place other than the active site, it changes the shape, and then the reactants are able to bind. And so allosteric um, interactions can cause inhibition or activation. And in metabolic pathways, these different uh, either competitive inhibition or allosteric inhibition can work in this feedback mechanism. Okay, so what is what is this? So feedback inhibition is a convenient way to, to regulate a metabolic pathway by using the final product of this uh, conveyor belt, of this factory line, to inactivate one of the enzymes, one of the pathway's enzymes. So here's how this works. We have uh, our first substrate that binds enzyme one, and it's, it's uh, converted to intermediate A. That intermediate A then binds to enzyme two to form intermediate B, and that then binds to enzyme three, which forms the final product. Now in feedback inhibition, the, the product of this, of this, uh, re this uh, multi-step reaction here can then go back and bind to enzyme one in this example, and it's gonna bind, in this example, it's going to bind at a site that's not the active site, and it's gonna change the shape of this enzyme so that the substrate or the reactant cannot bind. And so right here, this is acting as an allosteric inhibitor, but it's also this mechanism of feedback inhibition because it's inhibiting the product of the overall reaction is inhibiting one of the enzymes in the pathway. And then because intermediate A can't form anymore, because enzyme one isn't functioning, then you can't, then you don't get any more of this product. Okay, so we can have, in feedback inhibition, I've shown you an example of an allosteric inhibitor, but this process can also be driven by competitive inhibitors. So you'll see these inhibitors working a lot when we get into the nitty gritty details of cell metabolism pathways. The other type of interaction I wanna talk about are covalent modifications. And these can happen two ways. First, the enzyme can be made in an inactive form, and we call this a zymogen. And um, other enzymes can come along and cleave peptide bonds in part of the protein. And this makes the protein smaller, but then the enzyme becomes active. An example of this is trypsin. Trypsin is actually, it's a protein that degrades other proteins, and it's made in this inactive form that has to be activated. Another really common example of covalent modifications that activate or inactivate a protein is phosphorylation. And this is gonna come up a lot in the process of cellular respiration. So phosphorylation, right, is when you add a phosphate group uh, to, to something else. And so we've talked about the phosphorylation of reactants in the process of energetic coupling. But this is slightly different. And so we're not, we're not going to be um, adding phosphorylation to the, or a phosphate to the substrate. Instead, we're gonna be adding a, a phosphate to the enzyme. And when we do this, this causes a shape change again, which we refer to as a conformational change. And so let's take a look at this example here where we have an enzyme and we've got this active site here where, where this is where our substrates would bind. 
okay? And there's this loop here of amino acids, that's what this represents, that's blocking this active site. So right now, this enzyme is off. It's like a light switch, right? It's off. And what's gonna happen is when we get phosphorylation, this is gonna flip the switch on because phosphorylation, then char these charges on this phosphate group is gonna kind of rearrange the shape of the enzyme and it's gonna move this activation loop out of the way so that now the substrates are able to bind to the active site. And that's how phosphorylation can, can activate an enzyme. It can also turn off an enzyme. And we'll see examples of this as we move through cellular metabolism. All the pathways of cellular metabolism are connected to each other. So these anabolic and catabolic pathways. And this is represented in this really busy diagram here. And so our focus is going to be glucose metabolism or cellular respiration. And so we're gonna see this process here where we're gonna break down glucose gradually over time and so that we can use those high energy electrons, we can harvest those extra electrons to make energy, to make ATP. But what we'll talk about as we move through this, this material is that uh, nucleotide metabolism, lipid metabolism, amino acid metabolism, those breakdown project products, they can also feed into this reaction to make ATP. And those are those catabolic pathways. But sometimes we don't need ATP. We need to store the energy in glucose. And so those pathways can go in reverse in these anabolic pathways. So for carbohydrates, for example, we can take glucose in our body and we can store it in a molecule called glycogen. And in plants, they can store their, their glucose in starch. And so these pathways are connected and go in both directions. Okay. Now let's talk about the big picture, what's going on in the process of cellular respiration, right? We're breaking down, in, in this example, we're breaking down glucose and we're making ATP. So what is cellular respiration? It's carefully controlled redox reactions, okay? So just to review what a redox reaction is. Okay, so what's gonna happen is we have these um, two molecules here we have an, an organic molecule like glucose, and that's where our electrons are right now, okay? And so we can transfer those to electron carriers, okay? And a lot of times in cellular respiration, our electron carrier is going to be this, this molecule called NAD+. So in these carefully controlled redox reactions, glucose is going to lose its electrons. It's going to be oxidized. So uh, cellular respiration is the complete oxidation of, of glucose. And it's going to donate its electrons to these electron carriers. So this becomes now, it's gonna pick up a proton, so it's gonna become NADH. And NAD plus has been reduced in this example. So what we're doing is we're breaking down energy-rich glucose and we're harvesting electrons from those carbons. We're then going to pass those electrons, just like we did here, in a, in a series of redox reactions that ultimately ends at this electron transport chain. And in that process, we're going to, in the electron transport chain, we're gonna use energy from redox reactions to generate a proton gradient. And then we're gonna use that proton gradient to make ATP. So there's gonna be redox reactions, there's going to be chemical gradients, and then finally we're gonna end up with ATP. So we really wanna be thinking about how energy is being transformed in the process of cellular metabolism. So why do we go through all this trouble? That might be a question you're thinking. And that's because we wanna harvest every little bit of energy. So let's start by just thinking about this reaction here where we're going to just burn glucose, okay? So if we take glucose and oxygen, this will react, right? And the, the glucose will be converted into six molecules of CO2 and water will come out. 
but because of the energy stored in glucose, the energy is going to be converted into heat and light and lost. So this wouldn't be very good for the cell because in actuality, the cell only has enough ATP around in general to sustain around 30 seconds to a few minutes of activity. And that's because the ATP is not very stable and most cells, not all cells, need to make ATP all the time. So rather than burn up all this glucose at once, we're going to harvest a little bit of energy at each step in this process. And it's going to be enzymes that will help us um, do this in our cells and accomplish this task. And so this process has, been, has evolved over time to really be this very, um, very good, very efficient process at, at harvesting energy. So we're gonna break down cellular respiration into four processes, glycolysis, pyruvate processing, the citric acid cycle, and electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. And I promise these terms will mean more in a few days. But as you study each of these steps, you should ask yourself the same key questions. For each reaction, what goes in and what comes out? And as glucose is being oxidized, right? So those uh, bonds are being broken and those, uh, those electrons are being harvested. What happens to the energy that's released? What happens to that potential energy? How is it transformed? The other question you should ask, two questions you should ask is where does each step recur occur? And so we're mostly going to be talking about this process as it happens in eukaryotic cells that have organelles, including the mitochondria. And so is the reaction occurring in the cytosol or is the reaction occurring in the mitochondria? And if it's in the mitochondria, where in the mitochondria? And then finally, how is each process regulated? Is there feedback inhibition and is it an allosteric or competitive mechanism? So here's just the overall picture of cellular respiration. And this is an image from your textbook. And I think this is a really great image that you can come back to. And you should also practice drawing this out for yourself. But I just wanna walk you through kind of the, the major ins and outs of each of these pathways and we'll be able to add more detail to this um, in just a little bit. So we're gonna start with one molecule of glucose. Remember glucose has six carbons. And in the process of pyruvate, or, or sorry, in the process of glycolysis, glucose is going to be converted into two molecules of pyruvate. And in glycolysis, a little bit of ATP is going to be generated. And some of the electrons from glucose are going to be transferred to NAD plus to make NADH. And this occurs in the cytosol. The next process is called pyruvate processing. And this is going to occur in the matrix of the mitochondria. We'll talk about where exactly this location is. But in pyruvate processing, we're going, the, the pyruvate is going to be broken down into acetyl-CoA, two for every glucose. And pyruvate's three carbon, acetyl-CoA is two carbon. And so one of the carbons from glucose comes out as CO2, and that's lost as gas. We also make more NADH. Then acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is a cycle, so it goes round and round. Acetyl-CoA is fully oxidized to CO2, and NADH is produced along with another electron carrier called FADH2, and more ATP is produced. These electron carriers bring the electrons from glucose to the electron transport chain, where those electrons are used to establish this chemical proton gradient that is used to produce ATP. And this is where a lot of ATP is used. But this process, this electron transport chain, it requires oxygen to be present. So for cellular respiration, you need both glucose as well as oxygen. So here's that same process that we, that we just talked about. So this is cellular respiration that happens when oxygen is present. 
There's another pathway that a lot of cells use called fermentation, okay? This is for cells that undergo aerobic cellular respiration. So aerobic, meaning that they need oxygen. And when oxygen isn't present, they use fermentation instead. And we're gonna mostly use lab to talk about fermentation, but I wanted to point out some details. So during fermentation, when there's no alcohol present, the cells convert glucose into pyruvate. And this process generates NADH, and it also generates some ATP. We just talked about this. But if we don't have oxygen, there's no electron acceptor in the electron transfer chain. So we can't actually fully oxidize this, this pyruvate. And so we reduce pyruvate to some organic products. And in our cells, this is lactic acid, this is waste. And in yeast cells, this is alcohol. So we do this because ultimately we have, if we want glycolysis to keep occurring, we have to have NADH, we have to have somewhere for NADH to give up those electrons to regenerate NAD+. And so just what I wanna point out for fermentation is that it, it is for cells that are, are aerobic, so they use aerobic cell, cellular respiration, meaning they require oxygen. But if oxygen isn't, isn't present, then the cells will rely on glycolysis and fermentation. Glycolysis to make ATP, just a little bit less than fully oxidizing glucose, and they, they rely on fermentation to regenerate that NAD plus to allow glycolysis to occur. So I just wanna mention this now, because like I said, we're not gonna really get into fermentation in lecture. So just to summarize, these catabolic and anabolic pathways are connected and balanced in homeostasis. And cellular metabolism is this process by which we're converting biochemical energy from food to maximize ATP production. And, and when we're talking about glucose metabolism, that's cellular respiration. Enzymes control this process and are regulated through covalent and non-covalent modifications. And during cellular metabolism, when we're talking about this, keep track of the ins and outs and think about how energy is being transformed at, throughout this process. So that's it for this video and I look forward to seeing everyone in class. Thanks, bye.